Uh, good morning. My name's uh, Martin. Uh, I'm the pastor here at Trinity, and it's lovely to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, let me just pray once more uh, as we turn to Psalm 93. <coughs> Gracious Father, thank you that you have not left us in the dark, but you have revealed yourself to us. Uh, we pray this morning that we might be those who hear that word revelation aright. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. At Psalm 93 <clears throat> that Helen read to us a moment ago, the Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. At Christmas provides a bit of a break in our usual preaching program on Sunday mornings. And so a few weeks back, I was thinking to myself, what would, be, what would it be useful to look at together this morning during what I'm told is known as Twixmas. It's a very ugly word, isn't it? But anyway, uh, we're in that time period now. What would be good for us to look together at the turning of the year as one year closes and another year begins? Is there anything that it would be particularly useful for us to focus on as we face the new year ahead? A year in which, uh, no doubt, uh, as every year does, will contain things that we can't foresee as individuals, as, as, a, church, as, as a church family, as, as families indeed. Uh, things will happen, won't they, in our own lives, in, in the world that it will be impossible to predict. What would help us now, ahead of those unpredictable events, to prepare for them? Uh, every year, The Economist uh, publishes uh, 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 its list of predictions for the year ahead. It's quite interesting sometimes to look back and see what they'd said the previous year. How accurate were their predictions? Well, last year, looking towards 2003, they predicted, highlighted the fact that they thought India's population would outstrip China's, uh, that there would be an explosion of therapeutic, therapeutic use of psychedelic drugs, that there would be mayhem in the Japanese markets. Well, it is the economists after all. Uh, recycling would become a thing in the fashion industry and concerns over colonially acquired artifacts would become something of a thing. Now, I reckon looking back three, possibly four out of five, that's not bad really. Uh, but no mention of chat GPT and AI and no mention of events in Gaza. So what about next year, 2004? Well, <clears throat> here's the Economist's cartoonist prediction of what is going to happen. I don't know how clear that is on the screen for you, but the cartoonists anticipate elections. Uh, Wheels already prayed into that, and apparently 50% of the population will face uh, be involved in elections this coming year, not all of them free and fair. And top right, if you can make it out, there's the snake and the continuing blah, blah, blah of social media. Safe bets, I reckon, both of those. But, who, but the rest, who knows? One thing is certain, unexpected stuff will happen. And we'll be blindsided by events. Stuff will happen. Hopefully good stuff, no doubt. But living as we do in a fallen world that has rejected God, bad stuff, no doubt, too, inevitably. What can we do to prepare ourselves for when such stuff happens? Well, I think embracing the truths of this psalm, Psalm 93, is not a bad place to start. The Lord reigns. He is king, he sits on his throne, he is Lord, he is God, and he reigns. It's been commonplace, I think, this last year to draw parallels between our own time and the 1970s. You know, industrial disputes, uh, in rip-roaring inflation, national strikes, slow growth. If you were a church girl back then, you may uh, remember a chorus of the time went something like this. I won't sing it. But the words went something like this. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. 
Our God Reigns. And the title, no surprises, no prizes, Our God Reigns. Now, whatever its lyrical or musical, whatever its musical merits, and I'll leave others better uh, qualified than me to judge that, I don't think you can fault its theology. The Lord reigns. The psalmist says in those few words what the whole Bible says at much greater length from beginning to end, the fundamental truth, the Lord reigns. The Lord God is a sovereign God. He reigns over all. Generations come, generations go. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. But over it all, the Lord reigns. Nothing could be clearer indeed if you read the scriptures. Nothing more fundamental, possibly, to the whole of the Bible's message and more, or more important for us to embrace. Especially when unexpected, unpredictable and unwelcome things happen to us, which they do to all of us from time to time. When they do, when hardship comes, as they will, when in illness comes as it does, when those we trust, friends, family, let us down as they do, when things at home and work don't go as we wish, when things seem to be spinning out of control, when things are spinning out of control, it will help us to remember, it will help us to remind one another, the Lord reigns. He does. He really does reign. But the question I have for us this morning, how can we avoid our future attempts to encourage one another with that truth? And I think we do it by reflecting ahead of time, before the crisis, before the surprise and trials and difficulties come, by reflecting ahead of time on that truth by letting, by ensuring, by insisting of the fact now that the Lord reigns. Insisting that, that that now informs our thinking and our actions. When things perhaps are going well, our God reigns. He does. But uh, there's more to that here than the, the psalmist, uh, to what the psalmist has to say here. He's not just saying here that God reigns, there's more. Did you notice? He insists, his declaration, his proclamation, if you like, is that the Lord reigns. Now, I know there are many Bible students here who know that when our Bibles translate, you use the word Lord in capital letters like that, uh, they're translating a very specific Hebrew word. The word that God gave to Israel as his name, the name by which he was to be known. God proclaimed his name to Israel at the time of the Exodus uh, uh, by a name that he was to be known uh, of in Israel. But not only in Israel was he to be known by that name, but to all nations for all time. It's a pivotal moment in Israel's history. No, actually, it's a pivotal moment in world history. How so? Because by it, he revealed to the world what kind of God it was who does reign. His name revealed and defined in the early chapters of Exodus <clears throat> what kind of God it is who reigns. Just listen to how he defined that name. <clears throat> how he said who he was, how he is to be known for, for all nations, for all time. This is what he proclaimed, what Helen read a moment ago. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. 
It's an important moment in Israel's history, in world's history. It's a crucial revelation that the God who reigns over all, that the Lord is this kind of Lord. And it's upon that fact, that revelation, that all our confidence and hope depends. Our future, our faith, our hope depends on the fact that the sovereign Lord, who is slow to anger, abounds in love, is gracious and compassionate. Our future and our hope depends on the fact that he is faithful and trustworthy and honours his promises and keeps his words that he is just and righteous in his punishment of wickedness and sin. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ depends on these things. Our hope, our confidence in the future, our steadfastness this coming year, whatever it holds for us, rests in the fact that it is the Lord who reigns. As the palm, palm, psalmist here, verse 1, declares he does. Now, I know that some folk are a bit snooty about some modern hymns and choruses. Perhaps I was a bit snooty about one a few moments ago, saying 14 times in three verses, our God reigns. But before we get too precious about it, <clears throat> you notice here that the inspired lyricist and hymn writer that the psalmist was, <clears throat> he isn't averse to a bit of repetition as a way of bringing his point home. So here, Psalm 93, he says something, and then he says it again, adding a bit more. So verse 1, again, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Uh, those who watched the coronation of King Charles III this year may remember all the layers of clothes that he wore at the coronation. First layer, there's a shroud tunic, that sort of rather plain thing. Over that was the coronation stole. Over that, the super tunica. I don't think many people have one of those. Over that, the imperial mantle. And finally, the purple robe of estate. The Lord reigns. But this king's royal robes are different. He's not as other kings. He is robed in majesty. His robes are not made of linen, however fine. He is swathed in something else altogether different, altogether different. This king is robed in majesty, in power, in strength. Our creator, our redeemer, our judge, a sovereign king with awesome power to rule. Question, <clears throat> how can the psalmist declare, as he does again in verse 1, with complete and utter confidence that the world is established, firm and secure? One reason, and one reason only. The Lord is king. The Lord reigns in absolute majesty and power. And because the psalmist knows what kind of God he is, and because he knows to what end he directs his power, the psalmist can have absolute confidence that the world and God's purposes for the world is established, firm and secure. <clears throat> the psalmist knows that from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord is God. Now, at the time of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, uh, the year before last, there was a lot of talk, if you remember, about how she'd become the longest reigning king, uh, monarch in the UK. Obviously not king, uh, the longest reigning monarch in the UK. But that's not quite right, is it? I mean, there may be someone here this morning, I don't think there is, but there may be someone, and they're certainly still alive, who remembers a time uh, before Queen Elizabeth ruled over the nation and over the Commonwealth. But I know for certain there is no one here this morning who knows of a time when the Lord did not reign over all things. The Lord reigns. 
And again, at the time of uh, her jubilee, there was much talk, wasn't there, about succession. Uh, and of course, that's now happened. There's no talk of succession here in Psalm 93, because there will be none, ever. The Lord's not going anywhere, from eternity to eternity, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord reigns. But succession can be a time of uncertainty, can't it? And instability. There's no uncertainty here because succession is not an issue. For the Lord God is eternal king. So the world and his plans for it are secure. There's an order and a purpose to the reality that simply cannot be overthrown. And all who try are doomed to failure because the Lord reigns. Now, you say to me at this point, <coughs> Martin, I know that's true, I believe that. Or, or perhaps more re realistically, you say, I know that's true, I want to believe that. But it's hard, it's really hard. Especially when things are tough. Or when things spiral out of control. It's a truth that's hard to hold on to. And if you know it can be hard to hold on to this truth amongst the realities of life, notice, will you, hear that the psalmist knows that too? <clears throat> he knows that all too often things seem out of control. Now, the imagery here uh, of the sea, as so often in the Bible, is of wickedness and evil and disorder and chaos. So verse 3, the seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Wave after wave, trials, hardship, one after another, wickedness and evil. Wave after wave after wave, crashing down, each one bigger and stronger than the one before, reaching a crescendo as it grows and grows, threatening to overwhelm. Who can stand? How can they stand? How can we make it to safe harbor? Many here know from experience what it's like to be caught in such a storm. Face barely above the water, feet can't touch the ground, wave after wave, wave after wave, and it feels like we're drowning. Powerful, frightening, destabilizing, disorder, chaos, evil, rages against the Lord and his purposes and his people, his rule, his anointed. Wave upon wave, wave upon wave, seeking to frustrate his purposes, dethrone him, end his rule. The psalmist also knows, however powerful, however frightening, However destabilizing things appear, in the end, they are impotent. Why? Because the Lord reigns. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Our face may be barely just above the water. Maybe our feet can't touch the ground, wave after wave. If our situation feels horrible and frightening, if it seems desperate, if it's all those things... When it is all those things, it is then that we will need to call, recall to mind and remind one another that the Lord is mighty and he reigns. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, verse 4. The Lord on high is mighty. As the psalmist says elsewhere of those who might imagine that the Lord's rule can be frustrated, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. For the Lord is mightier. He is robed in majesty. He is armed with strength. And he reigns. I wonder if you remember the story of Job <clears throat> and God's word to him. You may, you may remember he faced a few storms in life over many years experiencing both highs and lows, very high highs and very low lows. Were they predictable? No. Did he see them coming? No. Did they seem fair? 
No. Could anyone make any sense of why such things happened to him? Well, lots of people tried and failed. Pretty much everyone got it wrong. Job felt overwhelmed by the thunder of the great waters. Do you remember God's words to him? Actually, why don't we turn to it? It's on page 538, Job 38, where again, events, evil, wickedness, that seem overwhelming to Job. Well, as he faces them, this is what the Lord says. They are no problem to him. Verse 8. Who shuts up the sea behind doors when it bursts forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garments and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, thus far, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. And Jacob, uh, Job's con conclusion later on, 40, chapter 42, verse 2, he says to God, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. So back to Psalm 93. Have we got it yet? The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. He is mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. And we will do good to remember that as individuals, as a church family, this coming year. No doubt, as Karen said, we nurse hopes for it and perhaps fears too. No doubt it will bring both highs and lows. When both of those come, and especially perhaps when the lows come, it will be good, do us good to recall and to remind one another, the Lord, he is God, he reigns, and no purpose of his can be thwarted. That will be true this year when things go well, when hopes and dreams are being fulfilled, and it will be just as true when things are not going well when hopes are not being fulfilled, when dreams are turning to dust and everything is falling apart. But if we can embrace that truth now, if it become, can become a truth that lies at the heart of our thinking and being, a core part of our understanding, if we can rejoice with the psalmist here, if we can say with Job to God, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted, Amidst the storms and trials that will come, we will be able to rest in the sovereign rule of a gracious, compassionate, patient, loving, faithful, just, and forgiving God. Confident in the knowledge that his good purposes cannot be thwarted. And if we meditate on those truths now, perhaps when things are calm, preach them to ourselves now, remind one another of them now, live conscious of that reality now, well, then it won't come across as trite or just a cliche when we remind ourselves of this truth in the heat of conflict, in the faith of trial and disappointment. When we remind one another that the Lord does reign and our confidence rests there. We'll simply be reminding one another of what we already know from experience is true. A profound truth that will anchor us, keep us steadfast and secure as the storm rages and the billows roll. It will be just what we need to hear to be reminded that God is mighty, he reigns, and nothing Nothing, however powerful, can frustrate his purposes. Christ will build his church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And nothing in the year ahead, neither trouble, nor hardship, nor persecution, nor famine, nor nakedness, nor danger, nor sword, can separate us from the love of Christ. For 
the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, thank you for that clear declaration, the revelation that you do indeed reign, that you are robed in majesty, power and strength, and nothing of your purposes can be frustrated. Heavenly Father, help us to rest in that truth now and in the days, weeks, and months to come. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.